Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In today's uh, lecture 18th, uh, we continue our discussion on uh, solving parabolic partial differential equation by classical methods. These are essentially explicit methods and one of the property of this explicit method is that it brings in its own um, numerical characteristics as opposed to the physical characteristics and as demonstration, we are going to show the FTCS method and we will see that uh, it brings in significant uh, restriction on the time steps and one of the way to avoid this problem of uh, time step restriction is to switch over to implicit methods and this is demonstrated uh, today by again considering the heat equation. Uh, one of the disadvantage of this implicit method is that we will have to be now solving matrix equation. But fortunately enough for the heat equation, this turns out to be a tridiagonal matrix and which yields an exact solution by using Thomas algorithm. <coughs> uh, having adopted the implicit method, one would like to once again go through that stability analysis by the spectral analysis tool and uh, we will establish its stability and its enhanced uh, ability to take larger time step. <coughs> However, at the same time, when we have uh, periodic boundary conditions uh, or the periodic problems, uh, we need to convert this tridiagonal matrix into its variation called the periodic tridiagonal matrix and this will be studied in detail. Uh, we are solving parabolic partial differential equation and today we just demonstrated first, first taking a one dimensional heat equation as given here. Uh, partial derivative of u with respect to time is equal to the second derivative of u with respect to x and uh, this is defined in a x t plane with uh, spacing indicated by index i along the x direction and j along the time direction and uh, we specifically talk about a simplest possible explicit algorithm which is called as forward in time centered in space or FTCS algorithm and that involves uh, taking this time derivative u of t and writing it in this form on the left hand side. <coughs> the same way we can take uh, the second derivative of u with respect to x on the right hand side and represent it by this difference expression. Um, having done that, we note that uh, the points involved in this uh, algorithm are given here by uh, this dotted points that is u i j plus 1 which is at the advanced time level j plus 1 at time level depends on the other three points which are given on the line below. In the language of computation, this participating node points constitute what is called as the computational molecule. So, this is what we are going to call as the computational molecule. <coughs> now, uh, in uh, looking at this problem, we know that uh, this is a parabolic partial differential equation. So, it is uh, physical characteristics are nothing but t equal to constant and this is what we have as the physical characteristics. Whereas, we note that uh, the node at the advanced time level actually depends on these three points and this three points again in turn depend on their corresponding three dependent points that is uh, this one this one and this one and for this, this point, this point and this point. So, what actually uh, 
means that this point eventually depends on a cone which is defined by a line like this. Uh, the extremities of the cone is given by this and these are what are called as the numerical characteristics. Thus, we understand one uh, interesting attribute of all computing is the distinction between the physical and the numerical characteristics. This is something very fundamental that we will be visiting again and again and we will point out that one of the goals or the accuracy of the solution depends on how we bring this numerical characteristics as close to the physical characteristics as possible. So, this is a single one, but here we end up getting two branches, right? That is what we get. <coughs> now, you can uh, very clearly see that uh, to make uh, the thing work for you, you should uh, have these two sets of uh, characteristics approach each other. How do you do that? A very uh, simple observation is if I uh, reduce delta t, then what will happen? This wedge will open up towards the theoretical limit, right? the physical characteristics. So, that is what we can do. So, the way to do that, so maybe hmm. if I have to make this observation, delta t should be as uh, small as possible. So, that is uh, the rule of the game <coughs> that that is one of the way, but you already know from your uh, experience in uh, computing what you have done just now I am going to submit uh, today uh, that uh, taking smaller time step also makes the process uh, very, very slow. So, that is not a very uh, good option. Uh, that brings us to the question of uh, trying to find out if there are other methods which will do that um, as desirably as possible at the same time would not uh, consume too much of uh, uh, time and resources. Right? <coughs> In this context, we start uh, talking about implicit methods and you can uh, see the motivation actually comes from this uh, diagram that we have here. We want this uh, physical characteristics and the numerical characteristics approach each other. <coughs> and how do you do it? Uh, that is uh, noted here that what we had done here, when I wrote this FTCS algorithm, what I did? I evaluated this at say some node which I called as x i and I tried to get uh, the time level which I called as T j and uh, what did I do is uh, I wrote this as u x x uh, evaluated. Now, u x x is evaluated at what level? At the jth level also. right? So, that is also uh, written for the ith node. Uh, and this. And as a consequence, we add this uh, wedge. Now, what we could do is, uh, if I uh, do the following, like what we have written down here in equation 15, that we will take the right hand side, evaluate it at uh, two time levels. Okay? One is uh, at the jth level and suitably blended with the second derivative evaluated at the uh, prior level. So, 
basically then what we are doing, we are doing uh, right, rewriting the right hand side as a weighted average. Okay. How is the weighting done? Of course, uh, lambda has to be uh, between 0 and 1 and then if I uh, do this, what I am doing actually? Uh, the first term, if I look at it, would involve these three parts, right? Because I am evaluating that at the j plus 1th level. So, that is what we are going to do. Whereas, uh, this 1 minus lambda times uh, u x x are those three points that we had before. So, what we are doing, we are now instead of having a computational molecule involving four points, we are having it in terms of six points, six points. And what we are doing then, instead of taking the value which defines the molecule at uh, these three points, we are taking some kind of a weighted average between this point and that point, that point and that point and that and this. So, this is the sequence. So, what happens is, depending on the choice of lambda, we could do many things. For example, if I would uh, set lambda equal to 0, that is I do not evaluate the derivative at the advanced time level, get everything from the previous one, then we go back to our FTCS algorithm that we have, we can very clearly see. So, this will be just simply that what we have written over there. <coughs> now, uh, th this is what um, two gentlemen from Cambridge, Crank and Nicholson, uh, they did it uh, in uh, mid 40s. What they said that take a kind of a unbiased average, take half and half contribution coming from each time level. That is that's your lambda equal to half means. All right? So, I will take the second derivative evaluated at uh, the advanced time level 50 percent and the rest of it is coming from the previous time level. Right? Now, we could also of course, it is a whole continuum. You could choose a value of lambda anywhere between 0 and 1, uh, but we are looking at some very specific cases and one of which if I look at is um, if I take lambda equal to 1, then of course, this term switches off and all the contribution of the derivative would come from the advanced time level. So, basically then uh, you are going to actually have a computational molecule having these three points only. Okay? And then what you see? The numerical characteristics is completely aligned with physical characteristics. right? So, that should be the quite a desirable case and I think uh, this was done by uh, attributed to Lassonen, uh, if my source is correct. And this was I think done sometime in that era. Crank and Nicholson suggested this sometime around 46 or 47. And this whole approach of uh, blending the two was suggested by Crandall of MIT and um, that was a uh, big uh, game changer in the computing business that we uh, understand that uh, there are better methods that we could do that will mimic physics better and in the process you could get your uh, computational uh, methodology also quite efficient and fast. Now, uh, what does it do? What does it do is uh, it uh, actually now what we had done here as I had written in the slide before. So, we are doing it u x x evaluated at uh, right. So, this is what we are writing. So, if we are writing that, uh, then of course, we can uh, uh, expand it and if I do, uh, what I am going to get here is u i j plus 1 minus u i j by delta t. So, this is again Euler time integration, right. This is still uh, the Euler time integration that we are resorting to. Uh, all the balancing or subtlety is coming from how we treat uh, the spatial derivatives at uh, different time levels. If I uh, of course, uh, write this, uh, I would get uh, 
if I call that as delta x square and then I will get uh, u i <coughs> uh, plus 1 g minus 2 i u j plus u i minus 1 j that is this part and from here I will get uh, lambda by delta x square and I will write down the same stencil but now it is uh, evaluated at uh, j plus 1 at level right. So, this is what we are going to get. Now, uh, quite uh, like what we did for the convection equation, we can see some parameters uh, naturally coming out that we already have defined and uh, we defined the Peclet number if you recall in the last class that was simply the ratio of the time step by this. <coughs> now, in addition uh, we also have brought in a extra degree of freedom in terms of this parameter lambda. So, we could uh, define a new quantity which I have called that is uh, theta will be nothing but uh, tecla number times uh, lambda. So, that is simply nothing but lambda delta t over <coughs> delta x square right. <coughs> so, uh, you can immediately uh, comprehend that I could uh, simplify this and I could write down all the quantities which are at the advanced time levels on the left hand side that would involve this term and all these three terms right. Those are written down here on the left hand side ok. <coughs> that those have been written there on the left hand side and put everything uh, at the previous time level on the right hand side. This uh, basically gives you this equation. So, unlike the explicit method you realize that now you cannot uh, explicitly pick up the value of the unknown one at a time. What is happening now? Your unknowns are all at the j plus 1 at level right, but they are appearing in a coupled manner that is the i minus 1 i and i plus 1 they are taken together. So, if I look at that uh, what does it do? Well, you can very clearly see that you cannot solve it in isolation right. So, what we are going to do is uh, we will uh, keep suppose I have a Dirichlet condition boundary condition. So, that is u is prescribed on this two ends right at x equal to 0 and x equal to 1 they are prescribed. Then I write down that equation for all the points right. So, if I keep doing it then what do I get? I am going to get a stack of equations right. Uh, the first one will involve if I look at it here the first one will involve this point, this point and this point. So, 1, 2 and 3 what happens to 1? It is a Dirichlet condition it goes to the right hand side. So, you are going to have a uh, linear algebraic equation that has the diagonal term u 2 2 and say u 2 3 or uh, it is like this. So, basically what I am saying that I will write this equation let us say for any j. So, there is no problem, but I will write it for say i equal to 2 first. If I write it for i equal to 2 then I am going to get minus theta and u 1 j plus 1 uh, plus 1 plus 2 theta u 2 j plus 1 uh, minus theta u 3 j plus 1 and everything that has gone on the right hand side I will just simply write it uh, as RHS 2 ok. So, that is the whole uh, contribution coming at the point 2 by the right hand side. Now, of course, you can see so if it is a Dirichlet boundary condition this can also be transported to the right hand side. So, that is what I said that uh, this equation would simply have 1 plus 2 theta and I will have e 2 j plus 1 minus theta u uh, 3 j plus 1 and 
I will write this RHS 2 and put a prime to indicate the boundary condition uh, has augmented that uh, what we had earlier on. Now, I could uh, write the same thing for i equal to 3 and now you will notice that uh, this term of course, uh, uh, would be there. So, you do not uh, uh, have to, uh, you do not you don't need to take it to the right hand side, it, it, it is uh, an unknown. So, if that is so, and this I am going to write RHS 3. So, I could write all that. So, what I am going to do is I am going to stack that equation. I will start writing for i equal to 2, then i equal to 3 and write it for all the unknown points all the way up to here, right. So, that is the way the equations are stacked together and when you put them together you will get a linear algebraic equation like this where A would have the elements which are given here, right. So, how many non-zero elements that you get? Only 3, right. So, you will get the point corresponds to whatever the i value that you have chosen, okay. <coughs> that is here, right. That is I will look get it as along the diagonal and this term will go onto the super diagonal that is the next point, right in hierarchy. So, basically what we are doing, we are uh, following the sequence that i will uh, go from left to right and j will go from bottom to top, right. So, if I if I do that, that is that is what we are doing, we are fixing a value of j and then writing all the quantities from left to right and that is why we are getting this equation. A are those uh, coefficients of that uh, left hand side, x is the unknown vector. So, the vector it, it will be like this say 2 j plus 1, 3 j plus 1, 4 j plus 1. So, that is a stack. So, I am just simply uh, economizing on space and calling it as x and this RHS that we have identified here, they all go to the right hand side, right. So, it is a very uh, simple uh, sort of a migration that you can say that we have gone from an explicit method uh, into a business of uh, tackling a linear algebraic equation of this kind which is A x equal to B. But A has a very uh, neat uh, structure, I think I have it here that will uh, tell you what it is, it, it, it has a structure like this. So, you have the diagonal elements and you have a super diagonal element and you have a sub diagonal element, right. So, you, you can very clearly identify. So, these are your like uh, um, AIs, right. These are your AIs. So, if I have to write, so this will be my AI and this is BI and this is my CI. So, for every point I am going to get this. Well, uh, you might uh, think why I am giving a subscript here, it is not needed, it is basically constant for all ith points, it is same. But uh, let us discuss for a general case, uh, where you may have these things uh, which could be node dependent. Yeah, let us uh, discuss such a case and let me tell you that um, this equation despite its uh, simple appearance uh, is uh, a central uh, uh, methodology that is used in computing very often. You, you would uh, come across this procedure of solving this uh, tridiagonal matrix equation, right. So, this is why we are calling it tridiagonal, right. We have the diagonal, super and sub diagonal. So, it constitutes three non-zero uh, stacks uh, diagonal arrays. So, that is why these are called tridiagonal matrix. So, <coughs> that is your structure of the A matrix and uh, x vector I noted to you how it is going to be accounted for. So, we will uh, fix a j, run through all the i's from left to right, then migrate to the next j and so on and so forth. So, this is the sequence that we will be following in uh, cataloging this unknown x. <coughs> so, 
whenever you have matrices with uh, lots of zeros, they are called sparse matrices, right? And uh, this particular A matrix is not only sparse, it is also a tridiagonal matrix. So, what happens is, the good news uh, in this story is that uh, this equation can be solved exactly and this is what Thomas did and uh, it is uh, well known as Thomas algorithm and this is what we are going to now discuss how we solve this tridiagonal matrix equation. Well, the logic is simple. I have a uh, matrix A. I could uh, split it into two matrices. Okay? One corresponds to a lower triangular matrix, another would be upper triangular matrix. So, this is a very standard technique that you actually employ in linear algebra that if you are given a matrix equation with arbitrary A, what you try to do is try to split it up into three parts like it is called LUD decomposition. So, what you have is uh, basically a lower triangular matrix and this is a upper triangular matrix and this is a diagonal matrix. So, in this case what has happened? We have dispensed with the D part. We are just simply writing it as a product of uh, the lower triangular and an upper triangular matrix. And let me uh, just tell you how this is formally done. Okay. <coughs> um, because of that sparseness, so many zeros huh, all over, what we could do is we could write down this uh, lower triangular matrix is like this. So, above the diagonal, it is all zeros. That is why it is called lower triangular. right? But, because of the sparseness, what we notice also that um, even in the lower triangular matrix also you have a large number of zeros barring only the diagonal and the sub diagonal entries. Right? So, if I uh, decide to call those entries as D 1 in the first row, then L 2 D 2 in the second and L 3 D 3 in the third and so on and so forth. So, I, I, I have this formal structure. So, it would be our interest to find this out. I will tell you how we are going to find it out, but let me first tell you uh, what we can do with the upper triangular matrix. Upper triangular matrix will also have a similar structure by analogy, right? The lower triangular part will be 0 completely and the diagonal part here, I could have some value, but what I have done here, I have basically divided that by the diagonal path. So, that the diagonal entry has become unity and the super diagonal uh, entries are written as u 1, u 2 up to u n minus 1. Right? Now, uh, how do I find these uh, entries L, D and u lower case uh, quantities? Well, simple uh, thing for you to do is uh, take this L and u matrices, uh, take the product and equate it with what you have with the A matrix entries. Next, we are going to talk about a special algorithm called the Thomas algorithm, which is used to solve uh, in a direct fashion a tridiagonal matrix, which we have written here as the A matrix, uh, which has three en uh, entries, banded entries, B i's along the main diagonal, C i's along the super diagonal and a i is along the sub diagonal and one of the way in which uh, this equation can be very easily solved, this matrix equation can be easily solved is by decomposing this tridiagonal matrix into a product of a lower triangular matrix times an upper triangular matrix given by this. Uh, please note the structure of this lower triangular matrix which has B i's along the diagonal and L i's along the sub diagonal uh, elements. Uh, rest of the 
elements of this matrix is identically 0. <coughs> also note that uh, the upper triangular matrix uh, has 1 along the diagonal and u i is along the super diagonal. This is one possible way of uh, decomposing the A matrix into L times u, but we could also do a complementary uh, splitting, where we could have 1 along the diagonal of the L matrix, whereas the diagonal entries of the U matrix would be not equal to 1. Both are essentially equivalently the same thing, but it uh, is easy for us to realize uh, that uh, we can work out directly the entries of this L and U matrix by uh, performing a product. And for example, if I look at uh, this entry A11, that is uh, this B1 is nothing but product of uh, this first line of L matrix multiplied by the first column of the U matrix and that is going to give us uh, simply uh, as B 2 sorry B 1 B 1 is equal to nothing but D 1. Okay. <coughs> Similarly, the second uh, entry of the A matrix C 1 would be nothing but product of the first row with the second column. That means, C 1 would be equal to nothing but D 1 U 1 and <coughs> So, we can very clearly see that uh, u 1 is nothing but equal to uh, c 1 by b 1 itself. Okay. So, basically d 1 is defined like this and u 1 is defined like this. Now, we can uh, go through this exercise on the second uh, row of A matrix. For example, A 2 would be the product of the second row of L matrix multiplied by the first column of the U matrix. So, that means, A 2 would be simply equal to L 2. Now, if I look at uh, the entry B 2 of the A matrix, that will be a multiplication of uh, the second row of L matrix multiplied by the second column of the U matrix. So, that means, I will get uh, B 2 should be equal to L 2 U 1 plus D 2. And uh, finally, on the second uh, row of A matrix, we have the entry C 2 and that would be multiplied uh, obtained by multiplying the second row of L matrix with the third column of uh, the U matrix and that would be nothing but equal to D 2 U 2. So, what we can see that uh, if we uh, use this as the starting value here, uh, D 1 is equal to B 1 and U 1 is equal to C 1 by B 1 and then we can easily uh, obtain L 2 from this since u 1 is already available, L 2 is available. So, this equation will give us D 2 and once D 2 is known, C 2 is the given entry, we can use the third relation to obtain u 2. So, <coughs> we can uh, see that uh, this procedure can be generalized we can actually see the generalization emerging from this relation itself. For example, we could write A j is equal to L j and then we could write B j is equal to 
l j times u j minus 1 plus d j and c j is equal to uh, d j times u j. So, as before we uh, would be able to use this equation to obtain l j and this equation we will be able to use to obtain d j and the third equation would give us u j. So, that uh, completes uh, the splitting of the A matrix into L and U. Find the entries of uh, L and U matrices and that is your original equation A x equal to B. So, suppose I define U times x as G vector right u matrix multiplied by the unknown if I call that as g vector then this equation is nothing but L times g equal to b. So, in equation 21 what you are seeing you know the entries of L matrix you know the b vectors you can solve for. Why you can solve for because it is a uh, simple uh, structure. So, what you can do is you can start from the top you can take the first row and evaluate uh, g 1 then you come to the second row from there you can calculate g 2 because this equation will only involve g 1 right. So, we, we could uh, go through this that is what I am saying that g 1 would be equal to nothing but uh, b 1 by d 1 and then once you have that you can go to uh, any other lines from 2 to n. So, basically in solving 21 you go from top to bottom right. So, you have exhausted uh, knowing this vector uh, g. So, once you have the g vector then you will have to uh, solve 20 that is easy because uh, uh, that also has this uh, sparse uh, bi diagonal structure. So, what you can do is now uh, you can see the last row has only one non zero entry and so you can now go from bottom up sequence right. So, that is what we have done that uh, if I look at the last one then this multiplied by uh, g n should be equal to x n right. So, since I know g n so that means I have found out x n ok right. So, if I uh, figured that out then if I go to the previous line that would involve here g n minus 1 plus u n minus 1 into g n should be equal to x n minus 1. So, that is what is a general form of that equation. So, we could write that down. So, since I have a starting value I can go backwards from bottom up and get uh, the unknown x. Okay. <coughs> now, so this is the way that we solve. Why, why would we take the trouble of uh, going from an implicit explicit method to implicit method? provided we do not get uh, dividend. So, let us uh, try to find out what do we gain and uh, the best thing for us to really find out what we are getting in terms of its stability property because we recall that the fact that we have to uh, uh, apart from accuracy we will also have to uh, ensure numerical stability. For example, in your assignment you must have seen that if you take lesser number of points it just blows up. So, that is a uh, sort of a uh, defining uh, sequence of uh, nu numerical instability. So, here also we do the same thing uh, what we did here uh, do here is just uh, write down the difference equation ok. And we will follow the same language by defining this unknown in terms of its uh, spatial dependence in terms of uh, Fourier Laplace transform and we are looking at the mth node. So, that is why we are writing x of m and this is evaluated at nth time step. So, we will do this and we will substitute it here right. If I do that well uh, actually this is a little clumsy work I should have uh, used some other subscripts because this i and this iota should not be confused. Uh, this e to the power i k x is the square root of minus 1 uh, I think I will go back and correct it and load the correct one. I will exchange this uh, subscripts uh, in these equations. So, if I do that 
what I am going to get as we have done in the uh, that spectral analysis of the 1D convection equation, I will get the same thing. So, now what you are seeing here that I have a quantity that would be evaluated at T n plus 1 and the right hand side would be all evaluated at T n. So, if I divide the both the sides by u k of uh, T n, then this one will give me a g and because it is also shifted to the left by one grid point. So, that is why I will have this e to the power minus i k h right and the diagonal term of course, is uh, we are looking at i j th point. So, diagonal term will not have any such shift whereas, the last one is shifted to the right that will give me a e to the power i k h here right and of course, you understand theta is retained as it is and this u j plus 1 and divide by u uh, j that will give me the g. <coughs> okay. The right hand side is a clean expression. So, of course, uh, what you can see here then, uh, well, um, well if, you, if, 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 if you look at it, uh, I could uh, club the first and third term uh, on the left hand side together. So, I have e to the power minus i k h. Uh, plus e to the power plus i k h and then I have the quantity uh, 1 plus 2 theta into g <coughs> that uh, 2 theta into g uh, that is on the left hand side and uh, on the right hand side uh, we could take p minus theta and that uh, will give us e to the power i k h plus e to the power minus i k h and uh, the other quantity is 1 minus 2 p e plus 2 theta. Right? So, this is nothing but uh, 2 cos k h. Right? You will agree with me? Uh, same thing here. This is 2 cos k h and uh, what we could do then, we could write there minus 2 theta cos k h uh, and there is a g here, there is a g here. So, I will have 1 plus 2 theta into g is on the left hand side, I will have p e minus theta and there is a 2 here cos k h plus 1 minus 2 p e plus 2 theta. Okay. <coughs> so, this uh, I could write it as 1 minus uh, well we could write it 1 plus 2 theta then I will have uh, 1 minus cos k h into g and on this side uh, I could uh, also get uh, 1 here and then I could uh, write uh, 2 uh, times the theta minus p e. Uh, this will give me uh, 1 and from here I will get uh, cos k h. Okay. <coughs> so, of course, uh, this is uh, 2 sin square k h by 2. So, that is what you are seeing there. So, I am going to get uh, this is multiplied by 1 plus 4 theta sin square k h by 2. Okay. <coughs> so, that is what you are seeing here down below because p into lambda is theta. right? So, that is what you see the denominator and the numerator also similarly uh, is written in terms of this. So, what you can uh, notice is uh, that uh, this is also bounded uh, on the upper side by 1 because I can uh, manipulate it and write it as 1 minus something. So, it is never going to be above plus 1 that is guaranteed for you. So, to guard against instability all you have to worry about 
that it should not fall below minus 1. Right? So, that is what we will have to do it. And what you notice that uh, apart from the Peclet number now, you also have lambda as a control for you or uh, you can take the product of the two as theta as the parameter. And now, what we can do is we can obtain the value of g <coughs> and um, for various combinations of the parameters, ideally I could have done it in a three dimensional space. Um, on one side I will have lambda, another side I will have k h and on the third direction I will have the p, but to make the things a little more understandable, I will show you by slices. right? So, take a uh, very uh, moderate value or uh, low values of p that is about 0 0.01 and then plot the g contours in uh, k h lambda plane. Okay? So, uh, this is how you get. The interesting bit is uh, what is written on the top right corner here. This is the range, range of values of g in the whole space. If you now go back, look at this range. It is uh, ranging between 0 0.96 and 1. right? And uh, if we uh, look back to our FPCS algorithm, you know I did not write it, but you can see that it had gone from 1 to some value here almost uh, I mean 0, there is a 0 line and on this side we have an instability line, right? which had gone all the way up to have, uh, the last contour that we show here is minus 70. So, you can see the dramatic transformation, dramatic transformation because uh, this method was unstable in this part of the domain. So, even I am talking about Peclet number of 0 0.01, I would be looking at here. So, it is quite okay, it is quite okay that it will remain stable, no problem there. However, look at the value of g. This will take all the way from 1 to virtually uh, let us say 0 0.2, 0 0.15 that kind of value. Whereas, now by doing this uh, implicit method, I could actually bracket uh, that g between 0 0.96 and 1, a tremendous improvement. right? So, this is uh, what we get by migrating from explicit method to implicit methods in terms of numerical stability property. Now, if I uh, increase the Peclet number by a factor of uh, 10, so that is what uh, we have done from 0 0.01, we have now gone to 0 0.1 and uh, what do we find? The range is still not too bad, it is still uh, quite okay, it is between 0 0.6 and 1. It is between 0 0.6 and 1. And uh, you can uh, realize that, uh, that this uh, is the story for virtually this is your explicit method uh, will correspond to what? Lambda equal to 0, right? So, you can see this is your explicit method and this is your implicit method, fully implicit method. And you can uh, see that uh, there is a significant uh, improvement here that we do not uh, go below 0 0.6, whereas in FTCS we could have gone all the way up to 0. right? And uh, what happens? If you uh, take a much larger value of Peclet number that is of the order of 1 and then what you notice that finally, you started seeing instability. So, now the range has gone from uh, minus 3 to plus 1. So, what I have done here I have uh, drawn that minus 1 line here. We have drawn a minus 1 line here. So, to the left of which this region is your unstable region. So, if you take explicit methods uh, for value of lambda below this critical value, what will happen? You have to worry about some values of k h which are going to be unstable. Right? So, that is something you have to uh, worry about. However, if you take value of lambda above this critical value, then you have a 
fully stable method for all the KH range, right? That you have resolved with your grid. So this critical value happens to be about 0 0.2506. So all, all that you are uh, uh, able to see now that uh, you can get a very, very spectacular improvement in your uh, uh, ability to take much larger time steps. See, uh, these values of uh, Peclet number are few orders of magnitude larger than what you can do with the explicit method. So we are talking about improvement of the order of say 1000 times, 10,000 times, that type of improvement in computing. Okay, so this is what uh, is all about uh, the classical way of looking at parabolic equation and their computations. There is only one thing that I have not uh, talked about, which I uh, would like to tell you, is uh, this is more from a practicality point of view, uh, not uh, specifically related to parabolic equation, but uh, in many computing problems, what happens is we come across uh, conditions where we state that the variables are periodic in nature. So, what does it mean? When I say the, vari uh, the variables are periodic in nature, what we are uh, talking about is that uh, these values are repeated. So, whatever the value I have here, so if I call that as u 1 j, that will be equal to say u n j. So, the function is repeating itself. That is what you usually do with your Fourier series analysis, right? If a function is periodic, then you uh, say, look, this is my uh, the wavelength. So, it is going to be periodic like this and then we should be doing this. Now, all that I am going to ask you now to help me in writing down the discrete equation. See, the earlier uh, what we had, earlier we had uh, written b1 x1 plus c1 x2 equal to 0 was the first line. So, this was uh, when we did not have any periodicity involved. So, I will call them as non-periodic problems. And the second line had a 1 x 1 plus b 2 x 2 plus c 2 x 3 equal to 0 and so on and so forth. That is why you had that a matrix that when we wrote, I wrote uh, b 1 all the way up to b n and then we had here c 1 all the way up to c n minus 1, there is 0, 0, right. <clears throat> and what was your x vector? x vector from x 2, x 3 all the way up to x n minus 1, right. That is what we had. Now, if I look at uh, periodic problem, what I am talking about. Now, my unknowns, basically I, I do not have a Dirichlet condition. Instead, the boundary condition is the periodic boundary condition. That is what I wrote. So, So, basically um, my unknowns will be what? If I were to write x vector, so I could start from x 2 all the way up to x n 
Now, you see the difference because why did not I write x 1? Because x 1 equal to x n. So, I am just simply uh, uh, noticing that here the number of unknowns were n minus 2, here it is n minus 1. Okay? So, dimension is bigger. What about the A matrix? What will be the A matrix? Well, I wrote something totally uh, wrong, none of you uh, protested, but let me write it as this R 1, R 2 and so on and so forth. So, there, there, there is the right hand side, right? That is how we got uh, that implicit. Uh, uh. So, now, if I uh, look at this, what did I do? I had a R 1 prime. What was R 1 prime? If you remember what I said, R 1 prime was whatever R 1 that I had, I also had a quantity called A 1. If I, if I look at the point, so if, if I have this as i equal to 1 and I am now writing the equation for what? I am I am writing the equation for 2 onwards, right? That is how I have catalogued the unknowns. So, if I write the equation for 2, then I have what? Here. Yeah? So, I for i equal to 2, let us write one of the equations that you will uh, appreciate. You are going to get u 1 j plus 1 that is an unknown that is multiplied by a 1. Then I have b 1 u 2 j plus 1 and uh, c 1 u 3 j plus 1 is equal to r 1. Right? Now, what you are noticing that uh, this quantity is not a Dirichlet quantity, right? Like earlier, we could put it on the other side. So, what should I do now here? I use the periodic condition that is given there. So, I will write it as A1, U1 is Un, So, what has happened now to the A matrix? You can see that uh, corresponding to the last entry, I have a non-zero A 1, right? So, A matrix, if I were to, well, let me write it like this. I will remove this, okay? So, since you have noted this down, I will uh, expect that you remember what we are doing. Okay. So, now if I were to write down the A matrix, the diagonal entry still remains the same B 1, then I have the super diagonal. What about the A 1 quantity? A 1 quantity is nothing but, it will come here. Do you see that? That there are stacks of zeros and then you have here. Then of course, once we are in the uh, other line, there is no such problem, right? Same way, what will be my last equation? The last equation, if you allow me to erase this part, so we are not talking about non periodic part is easy and done. Now, if I try to write the last equation, well, what would be that? That would be a n. Tell me, n minus 1 j plus 1, right? Plus b n Well, R n. Now, this looks quite okay, except the fact that what is this? Our unknowns are from 2 to n. So, what is n plus 1 doing there? What is the meaning of n plus 1? Hmm? It will be what? So, x n plus 1 would be some point here, some fictitious point here. 
is not it. If I write it for this, this is involving uh, all these three nodes. What about this point? This actually will be here, yeah, right? Because it's periodic. So that's what we are going to do. That I'm just simply going to write the same thing, but here I will write C n x two j plus one is equal to R n. So now if I uh, look at uh, the last equation, then what we have here is that uh, B n remains here and a n remains here and C n goes where? C n comes here because that corresponds to x 2. right? So, this is the structure. So, what we have here is a periodic tridiagonal matrix. So, in the next class I will just uh, tomorrow I will tell you how we handle periodic tridiagonal matrix. This is not exactly uh, the replica of what we have done for non-periodic cases. And this uh, periodic uh, problems are uh, far too many for us to really understand and uh, digest. Okay. <coughs>